Good evening and thanks for joining us everyone this evening for tonight's Gore-Tex Pro Talk in association with Mountain Equipment. We'll be starting shortly. Tonight's event is presented by Jenny Tuff. All right, let's get started. Uh, evening, everyone. Well, it's good evening for you guys in the UK, but for Jen and I, it's good afternoon because we're in Canada. Um, thanks for joining us. This is the last, but obviously not least, uh, Ellis Brigham Gore-Tex Pro Talk. I'm Jenny Tuff, and I'm really excited that I'm guest hosting tonight with Ush Sorry, Ushin, I've never actually had to say your name out loud in all the years that we've known each other. <laughs> <laughs> I was so nervous about it. So I am just really sorry if I'm like butchering it. Um, Actually, we met sharing a stage in Dundee, I think, years ago when we had public speaking careers and we're both in Scotland. Um, and since then, we got to share lots of stages kind of all around Scotland, which was really cool. And I do remember one event where the English presenter wanted to say both of our names in the proper Scottish way. And I think he didn't manage to get either of them, which was awesome. But I still can't get yours. I'm <laughs> sorry. It's OK. I'm, I'm really used to it, so it's fine. Yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> Um, so Ushin, a uh, little introduction for anyone that doesn't know, um, has a lot of FKTs under his belt, such as the Coolin Ridge in winter, which was under five hours, I believe, uh, and some first ascents in Alaska in the Himalaya, and the one I'm most excited to hear about because it's one of my favorite mountains in the world, Mount Robson here in Canada. Um, so your background, you're from Northwest Highlands and grew up with adventure and crafting and hunting and walking in the mountains. I believe you even did the Coolin Ridge when you were a child with your dad. Am I making that up? That's correct. Yeah, you're making that up. Yeah. I'm making that up? Oh, I thought yeah. you said that in your talk. Did you not ever do it before? Uh, I'd done it a couple of times before, but not actually. I'd never I'd never been like on top of the Coolins until I like moved like until I'd moved away from seeing them every day. Oh, I'm just making up stories now. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, so in addition to being a really high level climber around the world, Ushtun is also a really good photographer and your words and your shots have been published in magazines all around the world, which has been really cool to see. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, well, I should also say I'm going to pepper with questions, but for you in the, in the audience, we'd love to hear your questions as well. So if you can just type them in and I'll try to grab them as much as I can. Um, so feel free to fire away at us. Uh, but to start with, um, you and I most recently saw each other here in BC, which was a yeah. really awesome surprise. What brought you over to Canada? Um, I suppose just the the big mountains and the like the, the really good ice climbing is is a is a main factor, and just the sort of appeal of going to new places all the time. So. Um, like all the different crags or different climbing areas are all pretty much brand new to me. So like that, that's just really appealing to me to like always be, be seeing a new place or a new climbing zone or, um, yeah, so I think, so that was like the, the main attractions. That's cool. So, I mean, you're really well experienced in pretty much mountains all over the world. You know, a lot of different terrains, lots of different types of climbing, but um, Scotland and Canada would probably be your most well-known. Uh, how would you compare the two in terms of climbing? Well, I suppose um, in the sort of in in winter climbing, there's sort of three different sort of things that make it like really different, and and one of them scale. So you have Canada, which is obviously really big, 
<laughs> and in this photo, if you look at this little red square down here, that's where most of the ice climbing is in the Rockies. And um, this is a sort of zoomed in version of it. And um, so it's starting in Canmore and sort of all the way up to the, the Highway 93 to Jasper and Mount Robson. And um, this is the north of Scotland <laughs> in that tiny little box in Canada. <laughs> So the scale is just so vastly different. Um, and so that's just a huge thing, like just the amount of space there is here in Canada. So that's, that's one big thing. The other thing is obviously the weather. Um, so in Canada, sometimes you get to ice climb in the sun like this, mainly because it gets really, really cold. And it's also a really, really dry climate in the Rockies. Like even the snow is really, really dry. So it, it's, it doesn't compare to the Scot the Scottish snow, which is very wet. It makes the formation of ice climbing very different, and obviously, it makes the challenges slightly different too. So, in Scotland, obviously, it's very wet, and at best, it's maybe minus three or minus five, but it feels feels really cold because it is really wet. In Canada, it's just really really cold, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so so it's just you're just like battling with like a like an actual cold a lot of the time. Sometimes it's, it's, it's fine because it's just minus five and dry and it actually feels quite warm. Um, and then the other thing is like, I suppose the like formation and features. So um, in Canada, it's more like you're climbing like bigger features almost. So the, in, in Scotland, it's more like there's a smaller crag and you always are climbing in a feature, um, like a crack or a corner. But in Canada, it's more like you're climbing something like this huge, big frozen waterfall, which is a route called hydrophobia in the ghost. Um, or if you're mixed climbing in Canada, you might be climbing on a route like this one to the right, which is cryophobia. And, and it's, you're more connecting the dots of ice. Um, so, and the way they form is different. And just the, the whole, like it, in the terrain is very different. So like you're in this huge big bowl in here and there's only one or two routes. But in Scotland, you're sort of on this smaller scaled down version in the mountains, but there might be lots and lots of routes. Um, so. So that's like the, the three big things that sort of make the winter climbing kind of differentiate, like scale, weather, and sort of features or formations. I love the way you talked about the cold, because when I first moved to Scotland, and I always get stopped everywhere I go in Scotland, because I'm always wearing shorts, and people go, oh my god, aren't you cold? Um, and then if I said I'm Canadian, Scottish people would always reply with like, oh, well, then you must not get cold because you're so used to it or whatever. Um, and it always kind of I always laughed at that because I remember the cold of the Rockies, that cold where like any skin that gets exposed can pretty much start to crack and bleed because it's so dry. Um, and I would always say like our cold is, is just so different because you can dress for it because it's like really dry. So if you put on a jacket, you can actually like be quite comfortable, I think, in, in the Rockies winter. Um, yeah. So I was kind of curious to ask you about like what are you having the same experience and how do you manage your kit versus like the Scottish cold versus the Canadian cold? Um, yeah, so I suppose in um, in Scotland, it's it's like we said, it's it can be really wet, and the way to keep yourself warm is to keep yourself dry. So and have um, clothing that works, even if it maybe gets wet. So I would always have like a Gore-Tex jacket, and I would always use like a very thick version of that, <laughs> like a Gore-Tex Pro, and then I would have a synthetic belay jacket. So that means it's, it's still very effective when it's wet. And I also have lots and lots of different pairs of gloves if I'm winter climbing in Scotland, to like swap them out because they always just get really wet. Even if it, even no matter what they're made of, they always just like fill up with snow or rain somehow. So yeah, you're sort of, you have to battle it that way in Scotland. And in Canada, it's easier when you're walking around or like going to climbing because like you said, it's just dry cold. So you tend to get away with just having a really warm down jacket. But one of the things I learned from being here is that sometimes it's 
slightly trickier when you're winter climbing or ice climbing here because the ice can be wet even though it could be minus 10 but the feature of the that's forming or the water source that's forming the ice could still be like producing what some water so when you ice climb it gets kind of wet and so that you're trying to balance that sort of like so like in canada i would have like a lighter i normally still climb in a gore-tex jacket because you do sort of get wet a bit but then for the um insulation i have and now i have a down jacket that has like a gore infinium shell on the outside and that kind of keeps it down dry but it's warm enough um so like you can see on this jacket here like it's got a, it's down underneath but it's got like a gore infinium shell and so where a normal jacket would be wet this kind of just protects you from that sort of moderate amount of water or like wetness compared to like you know a synthetic jacket wouldn't be warm enough and a normal down jacket gets a bit wet so like this new technology here has been really really good for me i've used like this ever since coming here and it's it's made a big difference actually that kind of leads into the first audience question which just came in which is what's your most important piece of kit that you own which is always the million dollar question for a uh, person like yourself <laughs> uh, sorry we use the most the the, the most favorite important bit of kit. Bit of case. most important bit of kit mm -hmm. uh, and then we can do the favorite if they're different if they're different yeah okay yeah we'll do, do them are different most important bit of kit well i suppose for both it's just just having a jacket that keeps you dry and it's got a big hood like that's like yeah. that makes such a big difference like you might you maybe wouldn't think of it but it's um it 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 just makes a huge difference so like having a big hood that protects you in 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 the weather no matter what happens if you're getting like doused in spin drift like in this photo here if um yeah <laughs> So, so I think, I think that's, that's a huge thing. Yeah. And I think people are really excited to hear about your kit actually, and wanting to know yeah. if you're involved in product development with any mountain equipment. Yeah. I should say. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Tend to do lots of things like, so, so that, um, that photo that we, that I last showed you of the, of the Gore Infinium shell, that's like a prototype jacket that's been sent to me for, for sort of before the, so like now they, they have that this winter it's coming out that jacket it's like their firestorm series but um like we've maybe been testing it for a year and a half now or something um, and it's been it's been really really good it's like a it's like quite a big step forward i think in technology like lots of the time there's like little mini percentages you get and like like you know maybe a new mid layer is like one or two percent better or five percent better but like having that like different that new sort of style of down jacket is like a it's like a significant step yeah, I think it's quite fascinating. Like if we think the stuff we were wearing even 10 years ago, like I remember my first backcountry trips and like my backpack piled up to like way over my head just because like if you had good kit at that time, that was how big of a backpack it was required to carry it. So it is really exciting. I think if you're into ultralight movement in the mountains, like the last 10 years and hopefully like another going forward, like technology just seems to keep on coming along, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. And it's sort of, it sort of ebbs and flows like what 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 sticks and what sort of sort of sometimes comes around and gets tried and then everyone realizes actually that that's a silly idea so it's it's interesting to see that sort of development of its things like slowly getting better and then every now and again you get a bit of a jump like someone will think of something and it's like like you know maybe maybe about 10 years ago people sort of came up with the idea of of having boots that had the gator built in for for ice climbing and, and like and that was like a really big jump but now and now everybody has that when you go ice climbing yeah definitely i was really interested because you kind of touched on the difference between when you would choose a synthetic jacket and a down jacket and this is one that i've never really figured out like with sleeping bags and with jackets like how do you decide which one you prefer like what are the main differences between synthetic and down so um this is uh there's obviously a lot of science in the background behind these things but for me it just depends how wet it's going to be so so in scotland i have tried taking a, a down jacket sometimes very occasionally and um, if it's going to be a really really nice day like the nicest day yeah. all winter then i might consider taking a down jacket and um, but other than that i just always take a synthetic and it's 
it's basically if the synthetic gets really wet, it still has the ability to sort of keep you warm, um, and it and it doesn't sort of fill. Not it's not it down fills with water, but it doesn't get quite so heavy and sort of horribly sort of sad almost. You know, if you get a down jacket really wet, it looks really sad. So, so if you have a sad <laughs> jacket. Jackets. I mean, no one wants. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Exactly. That that would make you feel so <laughs> ruins a day out. <laughs> so, so I would say, yeah, it's 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 just a matter of choice, and and a lot of the time as well, it's just like what people have. So, if you climb in Scotland a lot, you might just have a synthetic. And um, I mean, if you go ice climbing in Europe, that'll that'll suffice um, a lot of the time. But um, yeah, certainly in Canada, it really helps to have a very warm jacket. So we have a question from Maximilian, and this is something I was wondering about as well, when you were talking about the Scotland versus Canada and you talked about terms of scale. Um, so the approach is obviously really different in Canada, just that the country is so huge and we have like four roads. Um, yeah. So how would you compare the approach and, and what are you, we're wondering what you're using for the approach. Like, are you skiing and biking in? How are you tackling that? Uh, so in Canada, it's kind of weird. So I'll just pull up one of the slides. Um, so some, a lot of the time you get to ski in, which is, is really nice. Um, and you sort of, the driving is very similar to Scotland. It could be a couple hours of driving, depending where you are. Um, so, and in all sorts of different directions and, and the weather's quite localized, in, like, in, like at home in the UK. So it can be very different, different places. So it sort of takes a lot of time to get used to that sort of weather forecasting. But, and then the approaches, like once you leave the car, some of them can be shorter, which is nice, but a lot of them are similar, an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours. And it can sort of often be a sort of fairly well-defined trail in that you would, and you ski up. And sometimes you get to ski out like this and it's really nice. Awesome. But um, sometimes you can be like skiing through the trees and the trees here in Canada can be like very densely packed. So it can be like a real issue. You end up bushwhacking. And, and that can be really hideous. And also with the snowpack, it, you get these really, because it's so dry, the snow, even in your skis, sometimes you find yourself like falling through the whole winter snowpack. And it's never that deep, it's only about half a meter or something, but like, because it's the snow is so dry and so unsupportive sometimes underneath, it's it just collapses even if you're on your skis. And like, it's like February and you could end up on the, in your skis, like on the dirt, like, yeah, that's exhausting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> snow. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, um, a lot of the time it's fine in your skis, you're just breaking trail in your skis like you were going ski touring, except you have a heavy bag on. But um, yeah. if you're like in the trees, it can be like in this photo here, um, there's all this sort of burned out trees you can see below. And um, at the bottom of this, to get through these, like lots of them have fallen over um, and lots of deadfall. So you're sort of like end up climbing over trees in your skis and it can, can end up being pretty hideous. I think I have PTSD from that. I just went, I went across the Rockies this summer on foot and that was like, not with skis, obviously it was summer, it was fast and light, but the amount of deadfall on the trails, like trails that have been decommissioned or because of COVID just hadn't been uh, repaired this year. I think I spent my entire summer trying to get through forests like that. And honestly, just hearing you talk about it, I'm like feeling stressed again. <laughs> like, oh, that did hurt. Don't want to do it again. Yeah. It is hard work and it is endless forest, I think is a really big difference. Um, yeah. And that, I think that leads quite nicely into our next question um, about the differences and what you have to consider in terms of safety and the routes that you're gonna climb. Yeah, so the great thing about Scotland is it's generally very safe. Um, while in Canada, you get lots of avalanches and that's like a huge factor. Um, so yeah, like even like this is a really classic group polar circus and above it is this, this huge, basically it's this huge avalanche bowl. And this is like a really common um, sort of way that where the roots form is they form in where the sort of terrain sort of pinches. And then so, and then the ice will form there, like in this, in this route. So, and then it often means that the avalanche danger is really high or there's like a lot of exposure above. So in the UK, you do get avalanches and they are like something that you have to consider. But a lot of the time you, you can test as you go because all the avalanche dangers tend to be below the route. While in Canada, it's often above the route 
and you never actually get to like see the snowpack or see what it's like up there. So, so it's a really hard um, thing. And there's a lot of like avalanche forecasts that, that happen here, but it, it, again, the scale, like the avalanche forecast, it'd be like having one avalanche forecast for this whole of Scotland, the current, like where they, where they forecast in the region. So, so that does, it does make it really tricky. And there's more, becoming more and more like view, ways of using technology of people putting reports online and using the skiing sort of reports to sort of try and predict it. But generally you have to have a very, you have to just go with a very conservative attitude here. Whilst in Scotland, it's yeah, like, definitely. Can, yeah, you can go and try it. Um, and I suppose the other, a couple of other things you maybe have to consider is one is frostbite. And um, like, it's, it's like genuinely, if it's really cold, if it's a really cold snap in the Rockies, then there's certain areas you just don't go and climb in because it's so, it's, it's so cold. Um, so, and you, and you genuinely can sort of damage your feet very quickly, like in a couple of hours, if you've got your boots too tight and it's really cold. Um, and I actually, last year, I kind of like frost nip my toes a little bit. So, so now That's I, horrible. <laughs> yeah, and it was literally like an hour at Bile is what did it. So, um, wow. like now I always have heated socks on. Heated socks. There was actually a question about socks and people yeah. are really wanting to know, like, I think just because it started to get cold out now we're all starting to think our toes are cold all the time. How are you standing where you're standing there in that photo and keeping your feet at all comfortable? Yeah, so I generally walk in, in in one set of socks, so like in a normal set of wool socks. I tend to try and keep them quite thin so my feet don't sweat too much. And mm -hmm. then when I get to the climbing, and I do this in Scotland, I try and do this in Scotland sometimes too. Um, although in Scotland, sometimes it can be too, like, too wild to stop and take your feet out. <laughs> so yeah, and then I switch into my heated socks. For maybe not every time I'm out, I put my heated socks on, but certainly if it's cold. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I want to move us along because I really am excited to hear about your climb you did on Mount Robson this summer, which was a first ascent on the Emperor face. Um, can you, first of all, just tell us all a little bit about the climb and then I think we'll have a million questions about it. <laughs> okay, so the Mount Robson is the highest um, peak in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, it's also referred to as the King and this is the Emperor face. So from about here to the summit, which is way up here, is it's about 2,000 meters of vert. So it's fairly big. Um, and in, at the end of September, me and my friend Ethan Berman went and climbed on the green line um, up this new route uh, to here. And so it, it took us two days to get to the summit. So it took us one day from camping down at the lake here to get to the ridge up here. And that was like a really long, like 20 hour day with lots of ice climbing in between. And it was um, cool because a lot of the ice climbing actually felt really Scottish because um, it'd been such a big snow year here that on this face, cause it faces almost due north or northeast. And there'd been so much snow in it. It just melted and then frozen in the summer. It hadn't actually melted all the snow away. And that's how a lot of the ice routes form in Scotland. So it was really like the protection wasn't as very good, just like ice climbing in Scotland. But um, the ice was like really good, like ice, you swing your ice axe and it would go in first time. Um, so yeah, so that was like a, a really cool sort of experience to there. And then the next day we spent like 12 hours getting to the summit because it's quite a complicated ridge and it, it'd been really cloudy, so um, yeah. One of the quote, one of the first quotes that you gave after finishing this climb was that it was one of the wildest routes you've ever climbed. Is that still true? Do you still look back at it and think that was that was super uh, wild? And and what was it about it? Because you've climbed, you know, like in the Himalayas, which I would imagine are are wild in lots of ways. Yeah, it's it's a funny one because you're in relatively close to to civilization, like. From, from the summit of Mount Robson, you can see a highway. Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of weird. And, and like Ethan just texted me like a few days before we went out there. And he's like, oh, hey, do you want to go climbing next week? And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. And then like three or four days later, you're like halfway up this huge face. And it's got this like, like you feel like really committed because it'd be hard to back off at that point. And you're, 
and you're like it's just like all of a sudden you're just like whoa <laughs> well like if you with the himalayas it's sort of gradual right you like fly there and then like you slowly drive into the foothills and then you acclimatize and then you and then you sort of look at the mountain for a while and then you get on it but but in the rockies it's like you're just like you know drinking coffee in town and then a few days later you're kind of back to this big mountain and often just with the the style of climbing here it means that it feels kind of quite wild so is it just kind of like a slap in the face you're in the deep end just like that yeah right after breakfast yeah yeah right after breakfast at 1 a.m you're you're, you're kind sounds of, like you <laughs> yeah yeah you're 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 kind of thrown onto the onto the face there um but a really cool experience just sort of questing up this big face uh, that is um is is relatively well known and if it was in the Alps there'd be lots and lots of routes on it already but it's cool to sort of get the opportunity to do that so close to hope like where I stay like just quest into the into sort of some unknown bit of a mountain which is so if you're that, the first ascent you get to name it don't you yeah uh, yeah and and how'd you how'd that go you and Ethan decide together did you already know yeah. before you started uh, no we didn't know before we started um I don't feel like I feel like it's bad luck if you do that I don't know if yeah. that's true, but that's what I think anyway. So yeah. um, it was really, the, the name came from, um, well, I had never seen Mount Robson before. Like I'd seen photos of it, but I'd never. And when we walked in, it was, it was raining pretty hard and it was really misty. So I couldn't see, actually see the mountain. So it was like, we're walking in and there's just this big mountain that's there, but I can't see it. And I'm like, oh, and Ethan's like, yeah, there's a big mountain there. Anyway, so, um, as we've, we've like climbed it, got to the summit and come down and we're driving away to, to Vailmont to try and find some food before it all closes. And uh, the chain by Fleetwood Mac came on and one of the lyrics is running in the shadows. So um, I have a really good memory of sort of looking, sticking my head out the window and looking back and seeing Mount Robson for the first time. And it's like really big. It sits like 3000 meters, the sun, like straight above the road. So it's like right in your face. And so, yeah, that's how, kind of how we came up with that name. I like that. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't been around Jasper and Mount Robson, uh, it is the biggest mountain in the Rockies, but it does sit kind of alone at the very north end. So it really does stick out really high above all the mountains around it. And there's this beautiful, when you're driving on the highway from Vailmont, where, which is where I finished my run, where you would have gone to get your food, um, you turn the corner and if it's a clear day. You just suddenly get like the most photogenic mountain you're ever going to see in your life right ahead on the highway. And there's a million Instagrammers pulling off the road to try and get that perfect picture of it because it is just the perfect mountain and that's why it's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. I read from Ethan that he had wanted to do this route for a really long time, but but you really had to wait for the conditions. Like the window in the Rockies with snow is is so, it's so small anyways, and then it's different year on year. So was that just the chat that you had to wait until you literally got four days notice from Ethan saying, it's good, we have to go um, now? So... Oh, that doesn't look good at all. Uh, that's in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just in case anyone didn't know. So, yeah, <laughs> Ethan, um, I've, uh, I've forgotten your question. <laughs> oh, um, uh, just Ethan, about waiting for the conditions. Yeah, Ethan, Ethan had been in in uh, June, I think, to to try it, but it had been too warm. But that's when he'd seen how much snow was still there, and that's why I kind of thought that it would be good in the fall, and uh, once the in the fall you tend to get some good periods of good weather in the mountains and it also means there's um overnight freezes to relatively low altitudes so 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 it just means everything's a bit frozen together and in the rockies the, the rock quality isn't very good like it's something that um i really like about winter climbing in scotland is the rock quality is very good and it's something you don't really have to think about so much but in the rockies it's limestone and you really really want it to be very well frozen <laughs> before before you start climbing because that makes a big difference so moving on again um, because you're putting all these amazing photos up people are starting to ask quite a lot of questions about the <laughs> photography and that's also something that you do and that's something that you were able to do professionally and just kind of made that mingle into your climbing career um so the first obvious question is what kit do you use because i mean here you are climbing a really high level going ultralight um what are you taking to take these amazing photographs um, so I carry like a mirrorless system, like a Sony mirrorless system. Yeah, see. Um, yeah, and they're they're really good. 
I would really rate them. Um, and for a lot of maybe like other people, like the I started when I um, started taking more photos, I had like a slightly smaller system. It wasn't quite like what they call full frame. So, so that's like a, a good option for other people to use. And some of these photos are from like one of the first photos I had up was was from that smaller system. Um, but it's it's definitely feels like a bit of a commitment sometimes carrying like because you know like to go alpine climbing or even winter climbing you sort of consider all the weight of everything and you know you like sometimes I've gone climbing with people and like I've been mean, you know photo shooting some people and they're like weighing their spoons or whatever it is you know like well we take two spoons or one spoon and uh, and actually on Mount Robson we only took one spoon because I forgot my spoon <laughs> but, but um, and then we do all this like silly considering what to take like how warm a sleeping bag and then I like just pick up my camera which weighs like a kilo and then put it in my bag so kind of like cancels out all the weight saving that we've done yeah but surely worth it I mean is that something that you just started because you were inspired by the mountains while you were up there like what kind of got you into justifying that extra kilogram of weight and wanting to spend time doing that um so I think I think I like I like producing things like I grew up in a farm and I trained as a carpenter and both these things like everything you do you turn around at the end of the day and, and there's something that you look at that you've got like, as a product yeah and, and I just find that quite satisfying and I think that's just like sort of part of the way that I work but I really like that in climbing having like having like a really high quality image so so for me it's totally worth carrying the weight and like I've gotten used to it to this sort of so it's like you can physically bring something back from your yeah climb. almost yeah They're like yeah I yeah. made this yeah, and then, um, yeah, so, so definitely that's like a big part of it. And it's just something that, that I, I really enjoy. And I've just, I just started doing it by, I was sort of just going climbing more and more. And as I got into going climbing more, I took more photos. And, and generally you can take quite nice photos if you're going nice places. So it helps. yeah, yeah, exactly. It helps a lot. And um, so, yeah, for me, I find it, I find it really cool. And sometimes like, if I've been on bigger trips to the Himalayas or something, then um, I find it more—I uh, find it more satisfying to take back good images of other stuff, like the culture or some stories of what you are. Even even if you haven't like gotten up a big route or achieved what you wanted to, you still sort of have something that's that like I think that I would always sort of hang on my wall for forever or whatever. So so yeah, for me, it's a big it's a big thing. That's awesome. Uh, we're going to move on to some audience questions that are coming in. So there's going to be a bit of a mixed bag here for you to so get ready. Okay. <laughs> so Maximilian has come back again with, I'm just going to read this one straight out. Uh, do you make the conscious decision before climbing on the style of climb, like free versus technical, or do you take gear for tech climbing, such as ladders, <laughs> for a fast ascent, or how did you do it on Mount Robson? So I guess the question is, do you have the whole thing planned before you go and you know exactly how you're going to climb, or do you just come prepared for um oh so i suppose it really depends <laughs> so let's say um on a route like in in canada in the when you're um w winter climbing sort of on day routes uh there's often bolts in the rock and um, so and you take some ice cream so you can see the bolts here uh, and then in Scotland, it can be different. So you've got lots of trad gear here. And so for the day routes in Scotland, you often don't know what's gonna, you're gonna encounter and it's, it's all traditionally protected. There's no bolts. So, so you end up having quite a large rack. Like you can see that Murdo's got a sort of large rack hanging off him. And this sort of, you don't really know what's above you. So you end up taking, you end up having a lot of options. But it's a bit of a balancing act, especially when you go alpine climbing, because the weight matters so much. And there might be long stretches of easier terrain where you're not using much gear, but you um, you might really, really need more gear for just short, hard sections. And, and that was really the case in Mount Robson. So it was some short, hard sections where we were just sort of stretching all the gear we had for one pitch. Uh, but then there's big sections where we're only using our ice screws in the ice. So you never really know, um, and certainly this the style like definitely don't take ladders or any sort of stuff like that. Just but it's more like this this the style is that you're going ground up, so you, so you don't really know what you're 
going to hit, but that's kind of part of the, that's like the point. So, but it's, yeah, it's definitely a balancing act, particularly when you're alpine climbing. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to fire a few questions about, at you about your favorites that people want to know about. So the first one, and we'll just have to apologize to your whole social circle beforehand. Uh, who's your favorite person to climb with? <laughs> I know it's a brutal question. Whoever asked oh, it. Oh. Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah. Oh, way to put you on the spot. Um, I don't know. Um, oh, yeah. That's an incredibly hard question because it depends where you are and, and uh, yeah, um, I really like climbing with Ethan because he's very chill, but he can still sort of, he doesn't, he doesn't talk too much, but he just like gets it done. Yeah. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's reform the question. What do you look for in a climbing partner? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's sort of be able to have fun, like, but you know, like, and like, I think that's a huge part, like, and, and then there's obviously like sort of trust things where you want to really trust their decision-making because it does really matter, especially in sort of Alpine routes. But um, yeah, but most of the time, I think it's just getting along with them. Cause like, if you go on a, you're gonna spend all day with this person or you're gonna spend maybe even longer, like a month or two months. Well, you share sleeping bags with your climbing partners, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, sometimes yeah, I've shared a sleeping bag. We didn't, we didn't do that in Mount Robson, but yeah, uh -huh. like yeah, I've been been places with uh, Tom Livingston, and yeah, we've sort of used this mountain equipment has made us this um, sort of pizza slice sleeping bag that um, that you can share, and it's it's more efficient because it doesn't have like any zips, and it means that your body heat's shared. So it's a yeah, it's a fun. So yeah, I suppose that's a, a quality that I look for in a climbing partner. They're willing to Something share cuddle? a sleeping, sleeping bag. <laughs> Uh, the next one is, I, I don't think you're going to like this question any more than the last one. Do you prefer climbing in Canada or Scotland? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask that. And I think that in terms of winter climbing, I think that if you, if I took like my best Canadian date and my best Scottish date, the Scottish day would be better. Like that, right. yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's going to be more memorable. It might not be more fun, but it's going to be more <laughs> memorable. Yeah. Uh, and here's one more that I think you will also be upset about. Of all your first ascents that you've achieved, which one was your favorite? Uh, oh. Yeah, um, I, think, I think Mount Robson was a, is a really, one of my, definitely one of my favorites, particularly in terms of alpine climbing. It's just, it was like a really, a lot of, because it, like you, we got to have that sort of really big experience of going up and over a big mountain, but it didn't involve flying to the Himalayas. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think, I think certainly in terms of like alpine routes, that's definitely one of my favorite first ascents. It's a really special sort of, sort of route. Uh, and following on from that, uh, do you prefer trad or bolted climbing? Uh, I prefer trad climbing. Yeah, that's definitely what I prefer. Um, so I think it's, um, I just find it a lot more sort of adventurous and engaging. And, and I really like sport climbing. I really like climbing on bolts. Like this photo is me climbing with some bolts. Um, to some really cool ice blobs. So that's amazing to be able to do that. Um, but definitely the pitches that have been like hard trad pitches, both rock climbing and winter climbing, is definitely, definitely more memorable. And I think there's, that's for me, it's like that sort of questing into the unknown is, is just, it's so much more attractive than clipping the next bolt. Yeah, I understand that for sure. Um, and what about inspiration for yourself? I mean, you're in a position now that a lot of young climbers are really inspired by the stuff that you're doing, but who do you look up to? Oh, um, you people. Uh, so I think I just rattle off some names. Like like here, there's Barry Blanchard, who's a really sort of, sort of older climber in the Canadian Rockies. He's climbed so many things, like even way back in the eighties. Um, there's another one. That, Steve Swenson, who's climbed loads of really, really impressive things in the Himalayas. 
and um, I've climbed with him like Canadian ice climbing and he's like I don't know how old he is but he's definitely over 60 and he still climbs really really hard <laughs> it's really impressive cool. um uh yeah and and at home obviously people like Greg Boswell it's like really impressive stuff he's done and um yeah a few of sort of maybe like Ian Small is like a very dark horse in Scotland but it's done some really impressive impressive climbing um, first time I saw Greg Boswell give a chat in, I think it was in Edinburgh. Like it was the same show <laughs> that you and coming. I would have spoken up. He was, I mean, it was the middle of winter and he was wearing shorts. So I obviously liked him immediately, but it was, he's got his huge scar from being attacked by a bear. And the thing I hate the most about speaking, I mean, the only thing about speaking to British audiences that just drive me nuts is every time they go, well, what do you do about the bears? Cause like they just assume that Canada's just overrun by bears. And then sure enough, this Scottish climber came back with having been attacked by a bear and just kind of ruined everything for me. You haven't been attacked by a bear yet, have you? Uh, no, I've not, I've not been attacked by a bear. I've seen, I think I've been in Canada for a year. I spent a lot of time outside and I've seen one bear. Yeah, they pretty much don't want to see you any more than you want to see them. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, yeah, definitely. It's kind of funny that it's definitely the thing that most people like. Like I could go and do something really dangerous climbing and the thing my mom would ask is, you know, oh, are there bears? It's like, no, oh. it's like, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. it seems, to me, like, when you look at the statistics, to me, it just seems ridiculous that anyone asks, but there you go. Yeah, no, I, I think it is the number one thing that comes up with anything that I do in Canada as well as, like, and you're like, are, did you not listen to my achievement? You know, all your thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, and, and in, like, in Canada, it's like, it's like avalanches are way more, like, I worry way, way more about avalanches like every time I go out compared to. Compared to I mean, in summer stuff in the Rockies, I'm way more upset about the mosquitoes. Like they're actually yeah. going to draw yeah. way more blood and ruin my day yeah. for I still, drive me through the edge of insanity. Yeah, yeah I, I'd still say that mosquitoes are not as bad as the midges in the North. I was just going to ask that. Midges are mosquitoes. Uh, are yeah, I would, take, I, would take, I would take mosquitoes. Even with mosquitoes with malaria, I would take them any day. That's a humongous that. statement, dude. Oh, I think, I think honestly, <laughs> like we've all been in that midgy cloud where you think I like you might set yourself on fire just to get out of it. Okay, maybe, <laughs> okay, maybe not the skills, but I would definitely take the skills, like any amount of skills over midges. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I agree with that. Uh, we're being asked another favorite question: What's your favorite route in Scotland? Ooh, uh, favorite route. Um, I think I'll give two answers. So the like my most one of my most sort of like for me my most favorite route, which wouldn't maybe necessarily be the favorite route for a lot of people. Actually, no one else climbed it. So it's a route I did with my dad, and we did the first ascent of a route called the Giant in Scotland, and um, it's like a really sort that? of it's a, a in the Cairngorms in, at Craig and Dulock, so it's a really steep. A bit of granite and it's like got this big ice smear down it which is quite unusual for Scotland and it was a really it was just a really sort of special day and, and a really like a really good route and something I'll always remember and then maybe like other favorite routes in Scotland I think maybe Ecstasy is a route in Scotland it's a grade eight on Craig Meggy and it's sort of really good sort of classic Scottish climbing it's got everything it's got bits of like steep mixed climbing it's got a pitch where you basically just climb like frozen turf it's got some like ice little ice pillars and like bits of ice um so yeah I think that's like I think that overall that's like one of the best routes I've done in Scotland do you ever go back after you've achieved a route and you know check that off your list do you ever go back and do routes again mm. or are you just into the unknown only excited some, by no, no sometimes yeah it depends like depends like sometimes i've done routes i've done, I've done them twice just just because it's it's what's in condition and what's safe for the day so you go back with your friends and just have a nice day it's like just having another day climbing outside so you know i definitely still still do that but definitely get more out of doing routes i haven't done before absolutely um so i think people wanted to still know a little bit more about your kit so we're asked okay. about your kit setup, but that's so impossible because you've climbed in almost every different climate and you do every type of climbing. Okay. Um, so, but like, if you just did it in kind of a basic rundown, how would you give yeah. a basic introduction to Ushtin Hawthorne's kit? 
Okay, so let's assume we're climbing in Scotland in winter, and I'll give a basic rundown of that, and I'll maybe say any changes that we change for somewhere else. So I generally wear a base layer, and I wear like an Eclipse hooded top, so it's got like a really nice cut hood, and the zip comes to my side. Is that synthetic? Uh, yeah, it's like a waffle grid sort of sort of material, um, and then I wear like a mid layer, which tends to be sort of have um, a thin sort of primal off layer maybe, or um, some of these sort of like newer sort of soft shell sort of the mountain equipment version is a kinesis jacket, and um, so I wear that a lot as a mid layer, and then I'd wear a Gore Tex most of the time on top. But particularly in Scotland, I'd wear a really thick, heavy Gore-Tex, like a two-black jacket um, with like a big hood. Um, and then um, I tend to have on my legs, I'd have like a waffle grid layer again, the same as, or like a, just like some or merino leggings and then a hard shell sort of trousers, like two-black trousers. And again, they're like Gore-Tex Pro, really waterproof and really like durable sort of um, kit there. And um, then have like scarf with phantom text, the, the boots. Um, and gloves, I tend to have this slightly weird system where I use this thing called a Citadel glove, but I take the inner out. <laughs> so it's this like really big primal off glove. And I use that as my Bele gloves. So I have thinner gloves underneath, like um, I have the synthetic and then a Gore-Tex lined one. So like I have a thinner syn synthetic glove for lead climbing in, I have a slightly thicker Gore-Tex line glove for um, seconding in. And then I have this big primal loft glove, which I can just stick over the top of any glove. And even if both these gloves are wet, the primal loft is like really thick and it keeps your hands really warm. So it's really good in Scotland. And um, even though they originally designed the Citadel for like, um, these are the original pair of these big, this big red pair I've got hanging off in this photo actually. Um, and they originally were designed for like um, high altitude mountaineering. But uh, so yeah, we started doing this sort of weird thing and, and then they sort of redesigned them with some stuff, feedback from some of the other athletes and me and stuff that to sort of make them a bit better for both uses. I like the size of boxing gloves. It looks super warm. Yeah, that's basically exactly what they look what like. Yeah. yeah, but it's really amazing because you can have these really thin lead gloves on and you get to the belay and it's just, you don't have to like expose your hand to like wind and the cold you can just stick these big mitts over the top. And so I think that's a really, really good system. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and in terms of safety, I mean, either in Scotland or Canada, you can almost anytime if you're on a mountain, you've got no phone signal. So what do you, how do you think of contingencies and what do you do? Is it different in either country for you? Yeah, it is actually. Um, I don't know if it's, yeah, no, it is different. In Canada, almost everybody has an in-reach yes. system. Uh, on a subscription um, and the basic subscription I think costs about 15 pounds a month and that's like a two-way texting system that you can use anywhere in the world whether it's Alaska or Africa um, and in Scotland I've never actually carried one and um, I didn't really have a very small one like the newest ones are just tiny they're like this big so it's just like a, a it's like a really called the mini Obvious. isn't it yeah the inreach mini that's what i use and and it's it's so small it's that kind of like well why wouldn't i take it um but in scotland um there's bits and bobs of phone signal more than in canada and people aren't really switched on to that system maybe they're becoming more switched on um yeah and and i think that probably everyone should carry one um but i also um totally have, um, I'm trying to think of a way of saying this. I think that people should be free to not carry one. <laughs> like if, if people don't want to, like if you, and I, and I certainly get that, that sort of that feeling. Sometimes I just don't like having my phone or an inReach with me. And I accept that like it, it does have a slightly higher risk tolerance to it. Like if I'm running in the mountains in Scotland, but generally if I'm, if I'm somewhere that I know very well, then I feel comfortable not taking it. And, and there's something almost freeing about it. <laughs> and, um, I know that, that 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 is not the safest option or the safest thing to do, but um, I, I respect people's rights to not take one because <laughs> I have heard people say, well, you should take one, which is kind of true, but. I know what you mean. And I, 
I never really understood why we have a different culture towards it in Scotland because I'm the same that if I'm out here I always think to have my spot or ma'am reach or something like that um and for some reason in Scotland I mean I would have it like sometimes in the highlands like but only if I was yeah. going on an overnight trip for some reason when like yeah. it doesn't like yeah. I have, if I stop and think about it, I've got no logical answer to any yeah. of this. I go, no, you're right. I should have just taken my spot. Yeah, yeah. I, I but think we don't that, have a culture for it. Yeah, I think I think that um, it's if people often carry other things that are not as useful as like a safety precaution. So so like they they might carry like an extra jumper or something like that, right? And and that's just like. That's nowhere near as effective as taking an in-reach mini. So if you're concerned yeah. about it, um, and it's a good way, I think what's nice about them is they have free preset messages, and you can always just send a message. Like if you're running late, you can just send a message to whoever knows you're out, and it just says, "Hey, we're still fine, just running late." And so it's it's like a really easy way to update people. You can do it when you're at a belay, even because it's so easy to use. You just press like three buttons, and it sends it from anywhere. So yeah. so I think. It is a great resource and, and probably in Scotland, people, a lot of people would probably be interested in it if they, if it was more publicly advertised or it was a better system, I'm not sure. Yeah, and they are an investment. I mean, but to be yeah, fair, I bought true. mine something like five years ago. So I yeah. feel like it's, it's paid itself off. You know, they do yeah. stick around. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do. yeah. Well, I'm going to move us on. We have one last audience question and then we're going to wrap up pretty quickly. Um, do you have any ambitions to go to obviously climbing capital of the world, Nepal? Oh, um, yeah, I'd really like to go there. Actually, I've never, I've never been. I've been to India twice and Pakistan once, and a lot of the other big climbing ranges. But yeah, I've never, I've never been to Nepal. I would really like to go. Um, I suppose the trips I've done previously, I generally, I'm really attracted by the sort of remoteness of the. Of the, even the villages you're at so like a lot of the, some of the villages we went to last year in Pakistan like no, some of them had never even heard English spoken before and um, so it's really sort of like off the tourist trail and um yeah. and I, I really get a lot of enjoyment of it going to these places so so I think I will go to Nepal at some point but um yeah I've sort of enjoyed going to the slightly less tourist areas um so far yeah definitely I mean Nepal's amazing that if you're kind of like there's the Everest bubble, but you can yeah. just so easily never engage with that bubble and yeah. just the rest of it is quite wild and you can have yeah. a really authentic Nepali experience. And um, yeah. so I guess we have one last question, the obvious question, what's next? <laughs> uh, so I'm still in Canada and I'm going to spend the winter here. Obviously travel isn't, isn't very good right now. So that's, but that's fine. There's lots to do here for me. Um, and in the spring, you'll see potentially Alaska um, and um, yeah I'll see after that but there's nothing I don't actually have anything too fixed which which is fine by me I'll see I'll just see what comes up and and what happens I think it's a, a good time to stay flexible and I'm really lucky in that I've got lots of climbing options here yeah it's not there's no point in planning long term at the moment is there yeah yeah I think I think it's um yeah just trying to, trying to sort of just get out and enjoy myself rather than sort of be too focused on one thing. Well, I have no doubt I'm going to see your name light up the news anytime soon with a new first ascent. So looking forward to it. It was really cool to get to chat to you. And thanks everyone who tuned in and for all your questions. And anyone that wants to ask you further up questions, how will they get in touch with you? Uh, they can um, contact me on Instagram or um, my email is just my name. So no, well, not my, it's Eastern Hawthorne at gmail.com. If you can spell uh, it, you can email him. Yeah, if you can know. spell it, you can email him or any <laughs> other way. Yeah, I was open to sort of stuff like that. So that's fine. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, dude. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Talk thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for, everyone. everyone for watching. Bye. Bye.